All right, well, so let's go ahead and jump into the text now, chapter 10. You've got your study guide. If you notice, I've been putting up at the top kind of a title for the chapters. And this is, it says, Prelude to the End of Times. That's because this chapter is the preface to the prophecies that are in chapters 11 and 12. And chapter 11 is pretty, fairly long. It's, uh, what is it, 40-something verses? Uh, what, what is it here? 45 verses. So we'll probably take at least two weeks on chapter 11 to kind of sort out, because it, it, it's a lot of history. So this is the preface to those visions of chapter 11 and then 12 also. And so in looking at this, this is the vision, how it all came about. So this is a very interesting chapter. It's shorter than the two following, but there's a lot going on, and there's some things that are, I won't say hard to interpret because they're pretty straightforward, but to fit it in with some other things is like, what's going on here? Who, who, is, who is this person? And things like that. So we start off in verse 1. Daniel gives us the, the time signature for this. Uh, it, they call it a message or a vision. But he says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, and that comes down to about 533 B.C. Okay, So we're about 560 years before Jesus began his ministry. And about 500 and, we'll just say 33, approximately maybe 28 or 29. But over 500 years until the Messiah would come. So as you know, Daniel prophesied at the, toward the end of the captivity. But he was still, it was still during that 70 year period. So he tells us when, in the third year of Cyrus. So that means the kingdom of Babylon is no more. It doesn't exist on, in, 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 on earth. It's gone the kingdom of the Persians, remember the Medo Persian Empire had conquered Babylon. And so they're in control. And this comes up, this is important to note because later we'll see why. But he says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. That's the name the Babylonians gave him. And apparently he still went by that name among some of them. Uh, the message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message. Well, he understood it, and we'll see, he understood it after it was explained to him, but he did understand it uh, and had understanding of the vision. So he had an initial understanding, but there were some other things explained. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Now, that's important to note. How many days are three weeks? 21. Three times seven is 21, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, so yeah, three times seven is 21. So three full weeks, he said, he had been uh, mourning for three full weeks. And he tells us basically he was fasting and praying. He says, I ate no pleasant food, uh, no meat or wine came into my mouth, uh, not, excuse me, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So he said, pretty clearly, he separated himself and just went, spent time in prayer, mourning because, of, keep in mind, the, the captivity is still in full swing. It hasn't yet been given to have the Jews go back. Um, and so he's still sad about what's going on. Some have said it might have been right about that time because Cyrus, pretty early on, let the Jews go back to return. We can cross references to Ezra and Nehemiah and see that. But when they first got back, things it wasn't like they walked back and all of a sudden there's Jerusalem in all its glory. When they got back, the city was burned. It had been laying there uh, for 70 years. The stones had overgrown with vines and weeds, and uh, the, you know, the burnt timbers of the buildings were still there. So it was pretty sad early on. So the initial reports, even of the people that went to the, back home to Judea, they weren't good. It was pretty sad. But whatever the condition was, he just says he, he was mourning uh, three full weeks. And it is interesting. He doesn't just say he was praying. And we've looked at his prayer before chapter uh, 9, chapter 8. Remember, we, uh, well, the first part of chapter 9, rather, Daniel's prayer. So then he says, now on the 24th day of the first month, and we're not sure if that's the Hebrew reckoning. And the Hebrews had two different ways of reckoning the year. They had the uh, you might call it the religious calendar that started in the spring 
and then there was the, the civil calendar that started in the autumn. So sometimes it's hard to tell, but um, on the 24th day of the first month, so if this is uh, the month Nisan, then it would be the, the third week, and it would be a week after Passover. The problem with that is that, you know, the question is, were the Jews keeping and celebrating Passover while they were in Babylon? And if Daniel was fasting and not eating during Passover, it'd be pretty hard to keep that commandment. Um, so it just raises an interesting question, all right? And you can do more research on it and get back to me if you want, and I'll try to do some and get back to you. But if it's in the spring, then it's, it, it's covering the, the period of Passover. Um, he says, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, and the Hebrew there is Hittichel. If you remember in Genesis when it talked about the four rivers that f uh, flowed out of uh, the Garden of Eden, one of them was Hittichel, and that's the Tigris. At least as we, we use that word to describe it. Okay? So he says he's by there. Now the question is, is this in vision, or is he actually really by the river? And I think he's really by the river because we'll see he mentions other people that were with him. Okay? So he's there. So and then he says this, he says, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. The uh, New King James in the heading, they refer to this as the vision of the glorious man. It kind of looks like it's Jesus, okay? Um, but it doesn't say it is, and so there's some interesting things here. I'm kind of persuaded that we're looking at the pre-incarnate Christ here appearing, but some have said, no, this is just a glorious angel. Uh, if somebody wants to turn to Revelation chapter 1, and we'd like you to read verses 12 through 16. Do I have a volunteer? Eric, you want to do that? Okay, and then I'll need somebody else to look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and read verses 26 through 28. Ellie, thank you. I'll need you to read loud and clear when you get to that. Okay? So the reason why this is, we just heard Daniel's description of the glorious man, as, as we're calling him. Um, and then John gives his description of Christ. So you said Ezekiel 21 and 25? Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28. Okay? But Eric's going to read Revelation 1, 12 through 16. Go ahead, brother. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in the furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Okay, some pretty strong similarities there, okay? So it's, the reason why I'm relating this to that is it could be that what Daniel is seeing is Christ in glory, okay? It's before the incarnation, uh, but he, he's appearing like the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. He appears in the form of a man. Uh, and then the Ezekiel, this is what Ezekiel saw at the beginning of his vision. Uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the cold color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness <coughs> all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Okay, so... Uh if this is an angel or if it's Christ, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a heavenly person that appears in the glory of God. And that's what Daniel is seeing here. Uh, I think there's pretty, pretty good reason to think that this is the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to Daniel. 
But it doesn't say that it's the angel of the Lord, and it's, but the, the picture is kind of like, it's pretty close. But there are, you know, there's myriads of angels, and there's archangels, as the scripture teaches, you know, like uh, Michael and Gabriel, uh, who appear. Michael is specifically called an archangel. It just means like a prince of the angels, okay? Um, and so he sees this. So this is what he saw. And it's a pretty ominous, and when I say ominous, it's, it would be terrifying for, you know, if, if, if all of a sudden you turned and saw someone who looked like this, you'd do what Daniel did. You'd fall down pretty close to dead. You'd do what John did, and that's, you'd fall down, like Daniel says, he lost his strength. And so he says, though, in verse 7, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, and this is why I don't think that the whole thing was visionary, but he is seeing a vision, but he really was by the river when that happened. He says, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. So it, it seems like they must have seen the, the light or the glory or the something. And when he says that they didn't, um, uh, they didn't see the vision, it doesn't mean they didn't see any aspect of it. There was something, though, that shook them to their core. And if somebody would like to turn to Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 9. Well, hang on. Let's see. Uh, Acts chapter 9. Don't, don't everybody volunteer at once here, guys. Okay. Um, oh, who's that? Shirley? Okay, Acts 9, verses 3 through 9. This is Paul's, when he met Christ, or Christ met him on the Damascus Road. Just note, note the similarities. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the noise. So he trembled. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? <coughs> then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city. And you will be told, and you will be told what you must do. Is that verse nine also? Yeah. And the men, and the men who. Yeah, verse nine also. Go through to verse nine. Okay. And the men so journeying with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Okay, in the case of Saul, he didn't, the men didn't run away, but they saw, they didn't, they didn't, it says they didn't hear the voice. Elsewhere, though, Paul says they did hear it, and it's like, okay, Luke wrote both of those. Why would he say in one passage he, they, they didn't hear the voice, and another one that they they did. I think the answer is they heard something. They heard the voice, but not necessarily clearly. It's like when God spoke to Jesus, remember, um, when he uh, thanked God and said, Glor glorify your name. And remember the Gentiles came to Jesus and he said, uh, now is the Son of Man glorified. Um, and then he prayed. He said, Father, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven and said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it. And it says, some that stood by said, an angel spoke to him. Others said it thundered. So they heard something, but they didn't hear a distinct voice. That could be because, you know, you can, you can say, well, some were elect, some weren't. It could also be some were close by when it happened. Others were a little farther removed, and so they didn't understand it distinctly. Anyway, in, Dan, uh, in Daniel's vision, uh, the men that were there, they did not see the vision, he says, but a great terror fell upon them. Without more information, it's kind of hard to figure out what was going on, but something struck them to their hearts to the point where he says they didn't just flee away, they, they fled to hide themselves. So these are grown men that are, that are absolutely terror-stricken that run away to, to hide themselves. So it's, it was, whatever's going on is pretty awesome. So Daniel says, therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision. So everybody took off, and there's Daniel there. And he says, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retain no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, 
I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. You know, it's kind of, you kind of contrast this with some of the flippant attitudes of people that sometimes claim to have a deeper spirituality than others, and, you know, like Jesus is my buddy type stuff, and Jesus is your friend, and he does love you, and it's okay to be happy in his presence, and we don't need to be constantly struck with terror or something like that. But sometimes we need to be uh, aware of the fact that when the Lord draws near, it has a humbling aspect on us. You see this with John the Apostle when he saw his vision of Christ there in Revelation 1. We see it here with Daniel. We see it with Isaiah when he saw the Lord lifted up high in the temple. What is that? Uh, Isaiah, is that chapter 8 or 6? Um, and Dan Isaiah's first words were, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You know, he didn't say, Oh, yeah, me and the Lord are really cool buddies. You know, he was, in God's presence, he was very much aware of his own corruptions and failures and his own weakness. So Daniel basically falls over on his face. He doesn't say he fell over, but he does say, I was in a deep sleep on my face. You kind of wonder how he got that way, uh, with my face to the ground. So this was overwhelming to him. We see this sometimes. People get really excited. And what happens? They faint. It's not uncommon. Okay. So Daniel's asleep, sort of. Okay. And then in verse 10, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble uh, on my knees and on the palms of my hands. So if you remember when John had his vision of Christ, if we were to turn back to Revelation 1 and read that section, we'd see that John fell over like a dead man, he says. And then Jesus came and extended his hand, and uh, he that spoke and said, don't be afraid, fear not. You know, I am, the, I am the first and the last. I am the one who was dead and I'm now alive forevermore. So that same voice and those same words that John had heard at other times, like after the resurrection when Jesus appeared, first thing he said to them was don't be afraid because they were terrified when they saw Jesus. Uh, remember they thought he was a ghost or something and, they, and Jesus assured them that he wasn't, proved to them that he'd risen bodily. Um, so here the Lord graciously, the, the glorious man, if this is Christ or an angel, I believe it's, we're looking at Jesus in this passage, but he, he reaches out his hand and, and kindly, graciously, gently touches Daniel, and now he's on his knees in the palms of his hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. So he's able now, God, the word of the Lord comes, okay? And he tells him, stand up. So what's he able to do? He's able to stand. He wasn't able until God gave him that word. Then he said to me, do not fear. I love that. God, how many times does he assure his saints? Um, I saw a list one time. I didn't write it down. I didn't memorize the number. But how many times the phrase, don't be afraid or fear not or do not fear, appears in Scripture? And it's a lot. Okay? And there's a reason for it, because when we become aware of our own sinfulness and in the presence of God, it can be really terrifying, but because God's wrath against his beloved ones has been satisfied by the work of Christ in his death and resurrection, God pretty much constantly has to assure us and say, fear not. That's why it's good to read the Bible. You need to hear God saying in Scripture, don't be afraid. Okay? Because life can be pretty scary even on a good day. But here we see Daniel in this vision, he, the, the one, the glorious man, or the glorious um, being, whoever it is, okay, uh, I think, like I said, I believe it's Christ, but he says, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. All right, that's one of the questions here, and it's, um, uh, question eight was, what was Daniel's, excuse me, when was Daniel's prayer first heard in heaven? When he first started to pray. It wasn't like God said, well, you have to pray for 21 days and then I'll listen to you. God heard his prayer the very first day. But Daniel continued on in prayer. In, in one sense, you can say, you know, this is the, it's that old doctrine of prevailing prayer. You're persevering in prayer. And you can say, well, I just have to pray one time and then I don't have to worry about it. Well, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to pray till you know God has answered your prayer. Pray, and this, isn't not, this is not Pentecostalism, it's not, you know, charismatic. 
You can pray until the Holy Spirit gives you an assurance in your heart that your prayer has been heard. Get down on your knees, close the door to your room, get your Bible open. Actually, you've got to close the door first, then get down on your knees. Okay. Um, and pray. And sometimes, as I had a, <laughs> I always remember those little, sweet little blue haired ladies in the Nazarene church when I was a teenager, and all these ladies that were probably oxygenarians, but they had a lot of good things to, to tell me. And one of the things was this that you stay on your knees till you know the Lord's heard you. And I said, How will I know? They said, You'll know. You know, and, um, it's important to do that. Daniel, he knew, not because he had a feeling in his heart, but I think sometimes we become persuaded. Uh, sometimes we just know, you know, Lord, thank you. When your petitions begin to turn into praises, you can be pretty sure something's going on in your heart. Okay, So if, you have, if you're burdened, keep giving it to Jesus. Not because you're always playing tug of war with God. You know, we do that a lot. You know, we give him something, and then we don't let go of it. Uh, if you need to keep praying, sometimes it's so that you will let go of it and quit worrying about it and put it in God's hands. That's not a call to inaction. That's just simply saying keep praying until you have peace about it. God really does work in the real world. okay? And um, sometimes it's because we're having trouble letting go of something. Other times we just need to keep praying. Daniel here prayed for uh, three weeks. All right, and if you notice this, he says, your words were heard from, as he says, um, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, that's what all of his fasting was about, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. And then he says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Uh, how many weeks is 21 days? Three weeks. There was a spiritual battle going on. By the way, the prince of Persia here, it's probably not talking about uh, uh, Cyrus. It seems it's there's something else going on here. This is something in the angelic realms. Remember in the New Testament where Paul talks about principalities and powers? You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's like, you mean like in the angelic realms? Yeah. One of the reasons why God kept Daniel in prayer for three days is there was a spiritual battle going on that Daniel didn't really know anything about. But it was being waged in heaven, apparently, or in the heavenly realms, all right? Uh, and it seems that, you know, these uh, forces of the darkness, which would be the, the king of Persia, as he refers to it, or the prince of the kingdom of Persia, uh, one of these, you know, uh, malevolent spirits, he says, he withstood me 21 days. That's the same time Daniel's praying. That's why I wanted to emphasize that whole thing about three weeks and 21 days. And then he tells him, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Now, again, so they say, well, if this was Jesus, why does he need somebody to help him? And I said, okay, that's, that's why I'm not, like, pounding the pulpit saying it's Jesus. There's no doubt about it. It's a heavenly person. This could be the Lord Jesus Christ. And the angels have ministries. And it could be in the Lord's coming to Daniel. There were things that had to be done. I don't understand all of it, okay? Well, someday we can ask the Lord Jesus, please explain Daniel chapter 10, because Pastor Stark wasn't quite able to do that very well, okay? Um, but here Michael comes to help this one, this glorious man that Daniel saw. And he says that. He says, and behold, Michael. And Michael, by the way, I've heard some people try to say, well, that's Jesus. No, it's not. Michael is an archangel. Uh, I heard one fellow... Um, say, well, Michael was, was God, you know, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, because it means one like God, and it does not mean one like God. Me, in Hebrew, <laughs> this is, here's your Hebrew lesson for the night. Me means who, in Hebrew. Okay, the pronoun, you know, me, is, it's an in interrogative pronoun. Uh, who. And then, uh, ka means like, and El means God. You already know that. Elohim and El. Okay, so Mikael means literally not one who is like God. It's a question word. Me is that's used with a question in Hebrew. It's who is like God. Okay, and that means you know none. There is none like him. All right. So Mikael has a really good name. All right. So he came to help this uh, glorious person, and he says uh, uh, that he come to help me for I had. Uh, been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So Daniel was alone by the river. The glorious person had been contending against these spiritual wickednesses. 
It says, now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. And we're going to see when we get into chapter 11, this goes way ahead, uh, hundreds of years. Some believe that it actually goes all the way to the end of history. And we'll see how that works out when we get to those sections. All right. Um, so then in verse 15, when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. Daniel's overwhelmed by what he's being told. And suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Again, is this Christ or is this, what, what are we dealing with here? But he touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? By the way, they don't capitalize the word Lord in the New King James because there is a question, is are we talking about a created angel here or are we talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? So the editor, I mean, in Hebrew, <coughs> Hebrew doesn't have lowercase letters. So if someone says, well, what is it in the original? Is it capital letter for the word you know, Adonai? They don't have that. All their, you know, Russia is the same way as I mentioned. They don't have a capital alphabet. They just have an alphabet. It's all the same. Um, so it's an editorial decision to capitalize or not to. They made a decision that there's no, enough here where this maybe isn't Jesus. This is not, perhaps just a created angel that's appearing as a messenger. So they left it uncapitalized because it's not necessarily a reference to deity. All right. So, okay. Um, so Daniel, but he is saying, he says, how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? Daniel's kind of addressing him like maybe it is Christ. Okay. Uh, as for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. He's like, I'm gone. Okay? Eric, did you have a question? Or are you just... Oh, I just joked, I think both Russian and Hebrew read uh, right to left also. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Okay. Uh, so, verse 18. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly blessed. It's nice how God so gently encourages Daniel. Notice this. Daniel is basically overwhelmed by his own weakness, his own frailty, his unworthiness to stand before God. And notice how the Lord continually encourages him. He calls Daniel, O, o man, a greatly beloved, as he said up there in, what was that, verse 11? O, Dan o, man, o Daniel, man, greatly beloved. Let him know God really does love you. you know? And here he says again, uh, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. Really powerful, comforting words. And again, this is an argument that yeah, I think maybe this is referring to Christ because this says, so when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. So that's kind of a prerogative of, of the Lord that when he speaks, it happens. So he's encouraged. He's told, be strong. Don't be afraid. You're a man greatly beloved. Uh, he says, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. So he says, um, I'll be able to hear what you have to say because you've given me strength. Then he said, and this is where the, it, the chapter is going to end in a second, do you know why I have come to you? Now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Well, the Persian Empire was conquered by Alexander the Great and his Macedonian Greek army. And so he's telling him, you know, right now I'm fighting with the prince of Persia, whatever this prince was, if, it's a, if I'm correct in understanding it as something in the spiritual realm, said when he's gone, or when I have gone forth, he said, then, then later the prince of Greece is going to come. So there's, there's a lot of spiritual battles going to be fought here. Uh, and later in the next chapter we'll see they were pretty intense. But he says, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. That's interesting because it's the scripture of truth. What's, what's he talking about? Well, the word scripture, it's related to the word script, it means something written. And the Bible talks about the books that are in heaven, you know, God's decree. Uh, if you remember in the last judgment, the books were opened in the book of life. So here he refers to, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. So he's going to, he's going to tell I'm going to tell you, I think we can understand this, like the scroll that Jesus was given in Revelation 
when he opened it, it basically revealed what the future held and what, how history was going to, or how the future, I should say, was going to play out. Here's what's going to happen. So that's, that's that scroll in Revelation. And I think this is something like that. He said, I'm going to tell you what is noted in this scripture of truth. And then this interesting statement, no one upholds me against these, that is the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, except Michael, your prince. Now that's why, oh, so prince is a spiritual, angelic being. See, that's why when we say the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece, someone goes, oh no, that's referring to Cyrus and later to um, Alexander the Great. No, because Michael, who we know is an angel, is referred to as to Daniel, who was uh, a Judean, a Hebrew, member of the people of Israel, he says, Michael, your prince. So Michael seems to have the, the care over the, the people of God. He was like their, their guardian angel in that sense, okay? And Michael and, uh, and the soldiers with him. You remember in the book of Revelation when the woman uh, that, that was clothed with the sun and the stars, when she gave birth, uh, Satan was ready to devour the child and he was caught up to heaven and then there was war in heaven and then Michael and his uh, angels fought against the, the dragon and his angels, and the dragon was cast out. Then when the dragon got down to earth, it says he then went to uh, go make war against the, the woman's seed and against those who keep the commandments of God. But Michael has other angels with him. That's the whole point. He's an archangel because he's the armies of heaven. In Malachi this Sunday, when I preached on the second part of chapter 1, <laughs> five times in, in just a few verses, the Lord refers to himself as Yahweh Tzabeot, and Sava means army in Hebrew, Sava, and Sabaot is the plural, and it means armies. So he's uh, Yahweh Sabaot, the, the, the Lord of armies. God has a vast heavenly host. Remember when the shepherds <coughs> received the annunciation of the birth of Christ? The angel was there, and then all of a sudden, it, li it literally says that the armies of heaven or the, you know, began to sing and praise, well, began to praise God. It doesn't say they sang, but they praised God. And um, so there's... A lot going on in the spiritual realm that we don't see. And apart from Scripture, we don't want to go prying into that. Paul warned about those who claimed to have visions of angels, but it was just from their own fleshly minds, and they were puffed up about it. So we shouldn't be looking for, oh, I want to see an angel. You know, it's like, that's a little bit beyond your pay grade, probably, okay? Because it's a spiritual realm. And if you start having beings appear to you, uh, keep in mind, that's what happened to... Muhammad and Joseph Smith, okay, or, or, or so they claimed, all right, but here this is the real deal, and this is pointing to Christ, and so here he says the, that the one that supported this glorious man in this battle was Michael the archangel, and again, it's, well, he doesn't say, he says, Michael, your prince, so we see in the spiritual realm, Michael had a specific duty toward God's people. We could say the church, and that would mean that Michael has a care, and we see that in the New Testament, uh, Michael had a care over the saints of God. So there's stuff going on that we don't know about. But it's okay. We're to do what's in front of us, okay? So that's chapter 10. Now this, again, is the prelude and the introduction to what's in the next chapter. If you want to read it, I hope you have a study Bible because you're going to see there's a lot of enigmatic statements in the next chapter about the king of the north, king of the south, the, the daughter of the king of the south, the daughter of the king of the north, and... This battle, that battle, these things. Like, what on earth is that time? I'm going to try to get that all charted out for you so it's not a complete confusion. We're talking about Alexander the Great, the Seleucid kings, Ptolemies, who were in Egypt. And we find out, oh, what do you know? We mentioned this before. Most of you probably know this. Cleopatra, we hear a lot about sometimes, she was a Greek. She wasn't Egyptian. Okay, She was a Ptolemy. They were the rulers in Egypt. So anyway, we'll get into all that next week. So be in prayer, all right? And I will uh, ask. Oh, Eric, why don't you close this in prayer, brother? Lord, we thank you for another day. The rest of the day has been a beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for the change in weather. We also thank you for the study tonight. We just pray that you uh, thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers immediately when we pray them. And you also encourage us sometimes to, to pray in your sleep for days until we know uh, that you hear us, Lord. So we just thank you for hearing our prayer, and we also thank you for the study, Lord. We just pray next week uh, we'll be able to find the conclusion of this vision. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.